Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to all of our donors and friends and family to our third installment of our fall webinar series, a conversation with author and historian John Meacham about literacy and the power of hope. And tonight, we're really going to focus our time on John's recent and new latest book, His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope. Uh, John, thanks again for being with us. It's a pleasure to see you, and we're so honored and grateful for you for taking the time to talk to us about an incredible American. Um, so look forward to the discussion tonight. Um, let me first, just by way of introduction, John. Um, John is a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer, contributing editor of Time Magazine. He's the Rogers Chair of American Presidency at Vanderbilt. And like me, he, you will all remember his beautiful eulogies of President George Herbert Walker Bush and Barbara Bush um, in the last few years. John, thank you for that. He's also the author, a best-selling New York Times author of Destiny and Power, The American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush, Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power, Songs of America, Patriotism, Protests, and the Music That Made a Nation, co-authored by Tim McGraw, um, and of course, this recent book. John, you know, it's hard to believe that it's been almost a year since you and Tim came to DC to celebrate our 30th anniversary. It really was an amazing event. Um, thanks again for that. You guys really you, you brought down the house, so so we're we're still thinking about that evening. I you know I thought it was all supposed to be a project with Faith Hill, which is why I said yes. <laughs> then I got draw. So it, how did that happen? Uh, I'm delighted to be here, even beyond the grave. Barbara Bush hits me with her handbag, and so here here we are. Yeah, there you go. I I, I hear she hits a few of us. There you go. <laughs> we always say she's still she's looking down on us. Well. Thanks again for being here. And, you know, John, speaking of, of, of Barbara Bush, you know, there's so many through lines, I think, um, that or connections that I saw in reading your book and, and Barbara Bush and President George Herbert Walker Bush and frankly, the Bush. Just an incredible some connections that I want to talk about, but really some core beliefs that connect, I think, Herbert Walker Bush and Barbara Bush to John Lewis. Um, and I'm not sure many people know that. Um, and I want to kick off with some of those connections and then have you re reflect on that. Um, they, there was an incredible dedication into country and a higher cause and inherent respect for human dignity and a belief that equal opportunity for, for every American was so important. And, you know, John's three decade career, as you know, well, spanned both Bush presidencies. Um, he was a John Lewis, a staunch supporter of, of of the Americans with Disability Act, which we know George Herbert Walker Bush signed into law in 1990. Um, he may have had a few policy disagreements with, with George W. Bush, 43, but there was so much they had in common, so many good things that they worked on to make that quote unquote more perfect union. From all the way from Bush signing into law, the Smithsonian Institution's Museum on African American History in 2003. I'm not sure many people knew, knew that, um, to supporting and signing and reauthorizing the, the Voting Rights Act of, uh, in 2006, to also supporting John Lewis's um, bill, the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act built in 2008. And then of course, President Bush 43 and First Lady Laura Bush also uh, attended the 50th anniversary in, in Selma with, with John. And, and President Bush 43 put it so beautifully, I think last month when he, utilized John Lewis, he said, we live in a better and nobler country today because of John Lewis and his inviting faith and power of God, the power of democracy and the power of love to lift us all to higher ground. President Bush said ultimately that John was this driving force of a call to service, a call to sacrifice. And for me, John, that's the connection that I picked up on between the legacies and the lives of John Lewis and George and Barbara Bush. Just love some comments from you about, about that. Sure. It's hard to imagine uh, people beginning in more different places in American life than the Bushes and John Robert Lewis. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, born in Milton, Massachusetts, to a future United States Senator, to the daughter of a uh, very successful early private equity guy. Um, I sounded like 41 there, didn't I? Private equity guy. <laughs> uh, uh, it comes back uh, yeah. whenever I think about it. Um, 
and George W. Bush, right? Born at New Haven Community Hospital uh, at the height of the early baby boom. Uh, they were born to immense privilege, and they believed that with privilege came responsibility and lived out that, that drama and that imperative. John's great-grandfather was a slave. Uh, mm -hmm. His grandfather and father were sharecroppers. Uh, his family didn't want him to get involved in the civil rights movement because of the ambient fear of violence in Pike County segregated Alabama in the 1950s and 60s. So they began from radically different places. Mm -hmm. and, right. They, they, they meet on a common ground, a common ground of idea, which is that America has to be about possibility. And both uh, John and uh, the Bushes were driven by faith. Uh, they both could be stubborn uh, in their uh, <laughs> partisan uh, orientations. But they did believe with St. Augustine, I think, that a nation at its best is a multitude of rational beings united by the common objects of their love. And the common objects of their love was this idea of opportunity, possibility, and knocking down walls and building bridges. And I think, um, I think there is a common denominator there. And it's a common denominator that we need to remind ourselves of all the time, but particularly now. Uh, at a point where in our history where so few of us seem open to reason and open to changing our minds if we're confronted with changing circumstance and change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's beautifully said. I think, you know, John, I, I think very few people know that they both received the Presidential Medal of Freedom um, the, same the same year by President Obama in 2011 on the same stage, yeah. same year. I was there that day. Um, it was a great day. It was a uh, what a crew. It was Brian Lamb, Warren Buffett, Stan mm. Musial. I still remember Dick Durbin wandering around with his mitt he brought for Stan <laughs> Musial to sign. Um, but that tells you a lot. It tells you a lot about everybody in that story. It tells you a lot about President Bush Sr. It tells you a lot about John Lewis. It tells you a lot about Barack Obama. Uh, it, and all of those folks, I think, for all of their differences, did believe in this common American enterprise. Mm -hmm. And I'm, it's not being sentimental or overly nostalgic uh, yeah. to say that. It, it happened, I think, in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember the night before, uh, uh, what was the name of the the Chinese restaurant in um, uh, Arlington that they loved so, um, the Bushes loved so? Oh, in, um, in Virginia, in Falls Church, Virginia. Yeah, it was I'm having a senior moment. Peking. Uh, Peking something, or May, something like yeah. that. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you, you sat there with this American president who had in many ways embodied the traits of Eisenhower, of, of a kind of service that we don't see much anymore. And John's the same way, right? I mean, he was um, a saint. Uh, and I believe that as firmly as I believe anything, that he meets the classic Christian definition. He was willing to die for the implications of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that that insistence on loving your neighbor as yourself is perhaps his most, his most vital uh, homiletic legacy anyway. Because right. that's the hardest thing in the world. Who wants to love mm -hmm. themselves? You want to love yourself. I mean, you're, you wish you were well, presumably. Right. You don't, I mean, it's, it's, the gospel is a radical and revolutionary thing. Absolutely. And it connects to points of light. It connects to the work of your foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the fact that uh, the Bushes quite effectively and convincingly, I think, argued about reading as a civil right mm -hmm. uh, links the two intimately. Absolutely. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, John, your book is really, it's about this man, but it's about this bigger idea, which is it's a huge part of the American spirit and, and where we're all working, sort of the place we're working towards. And in fact, John, you said that in the book, you say, early in the book, you say, Lewis was as, as important to the founding of the modern and multi-ethnic 20th and 21st century 
as Jefferson, Adams, and Madison were to the creation of the Republic in the 18th century. Why do you think that is? Explain that. Tell us a little bit more. Because we haven't actually been this country uh, any longer than 1965, any earlier than 1965. So think about it. There was not a single presidential election in this country that until 1968 that did not take place with some form of apartheid, at least in some part of the nation. In 64, you had the Civil Rights Act. In 65, the Voting Rights Act. In uh, 65, President Johnson signed the Immigration and Nationality Act, which mm-hmm. undid the restrictive immigration of the 1920s, which had been the legislation that had uh, hamstrung efforts to allow in refugees from Nazi Germany. We were not a multi-ethnic polity in, in terms of full empowerment, in terms of mm-hmm. self-genetic equal access until 55 years ago. And so that makes John Lewis, Paul Revere, or George Washington, or you know, pick your pick your founding father. Um, mm-hmm. And there are some uncomfortable realities here, right? Uh, we need to say. George Herbert Walker Bush, when running for the Senate in 1964, opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the act for which John Lewis was willing to die. So did the Republican nominee for president. Uh, There was a 57-day filibuster in the Congress uh, of that act. And yet, President Bush, unlike so many of us, was able to learn. And by 1968, in the wake of Dr. King's assassination, he supported much to the consternation of his constituents in the 7th District of Texas, the Fair Housing Act. And he always talked about the, the meeting he went, I think it was Memorial High School, um, or the High School on Memorial Drive anyway, and just this ferocious reaction uh, with people screaming at him. And he pulled out an Edmund Burke quotation which said that sometimes a representative owes you a reflection of your will, but sometimes he owes you his judgment. And his judgment was that if people, we were asking people to go fight for America in Vietnam and they were black Americans and Mm -hmm. didn't sell them a house in a certain neighborhood, that was a hypocrisy, to borrow a phrase from later, that would not stand. And that was a a courageous thing to do. And Mm -hmm. it's an example of what I found again and again in Bush 41's life, which was he didn't always conduct himself in campaigns and in the pursuit of power in a way that we could look at with unalloyed uh, approval. But once he had power, he invariably used it for the common good and, if necessary, against his own political self-interest. And that's redemptive, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's, that's powerful. Um, you know, as, as you think about, you know, thinking about others and, and not yourself, I come back to Lewis and, you know, you talk about how, just a little bit more about his character and you have some, a, a beautiful section where you talk about his personality and he could be strangely childlike. Yeah. He can drive, he had no girlfriends to speak of, he eschewed liquor and hell raising. Prenaturally, right. he was serious. He seemed gifted with the weight of wisdom. You know, yes. my grandmother would say he's an old soul. Yeah. Um, where do you think he drew that that sort of certainty and extraordinary patience from, especially at such a young age? I think there were three tributaries that formed the mighty river of John Lewis. One was an innate revulsion against the segregated order he encountered in Alabama. Uh, it just seemed wrong to him. His common moral sense was offended by the segregated world he saw when he went into Troy, Alabama. Um, that was one. The only white person he saw with any regularity until his teens was the mailman. Um, the other was the gospel. It was the tradition of the black church. It was the notion that God was not simply at work to make a home beyond time and space, but that his commission was to ameliorate what was within time and space in order to create as much as possible the kingdom of God or what he mm-hmm. the king would call the beloved community on earth. Uh, so he had that, he had the gospel, he had the stories of the Bible all in his in his head. 
The third was a early engagement with the broader, the news of the broader movement. So his family couldn't afford a subscription to the newspaper, but his grandfather could. And so he borrowed the Montgomery Advertiser, usually a day later. He read about the Brown decision. He kept waiting for white kids to show up in his school. Uh, he read about Emmett Till, who was his, the same age, and he very, mm -hmm. Lewis knew that he could have ended up lynched as, as right. well. He read about Authorine Lucy, who had attempted to desegregate the University of Alabama in 56. When he came to Nashville to seminary as an undergraduate, he, the fall, first fall he was here was the Little Rock Nine and the, 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 clash, the clash in Arkansas. And most importantly, he heard over the radio the voice of Martin Luther King during mm -hmm. the bus boycott. And a, uh, one of the things biographers do, and I, I found this position, I was in this position with the Bushes to some extent, uh, toward the end of their lives, they would occasionally turn and say, remind me when my mother was born and stuff like that. So it's, <laughs> it's not, it's kind of like being a dork Wikipedia uh, is kind of my role in life. Uh, but John always insisted that this, there's a sermon he heard King preach on the radio in 1955. It was actually a year later, which is interesting because that meant that the bus boycott had been going on all that time. Mm -hmm. and so when he heard that sermon and it was uh, King's, you know, King could. King never met a, met a metaphor he didn't like. Uh, and so he could make these things. He, John Donne looked like a simple poet. Uh, and so this one was uh, St. Paul's letter to the American Christians. And it was this long sermon about um, it would not have passed the Barbara Bush. Let's do this in five minutes test. Um, this long <laughs> sermon about what if Paul were writing an epistle to us? What's interesting about it is that Paul's letters in the original New Testament were incredibly urgent documents for two reasons. One is he was writing to populations that were often either divided among themselves and or under pressure from imperial authorities. And the other was they expected, remember, the second coming right then. They thought it was going to happen by Thursday. Uh, and so they lived in this constant anticipation. And so there's an urgency to, to those epistles. Um, there, there's a great point where Paul is dictating and he's he's frustrated and you, you can feel it. Um, hearing that sermon, John Lewis felt the same kind of urgency in the segregated South about the imperial authorities, mm -hmm. despite the divisions in the black community about how do you go about addressing this, that Paul and the early Christians had felt. And one of the things I found throughout Lewis's life is it was incredibly biblical. Uh, and we talked, he and I talked a lot about this. His first memory was of his mother's garden, right? So it all began in a garden. Um, he, as I said, he, he sort of moved away from his family in the way that Jesus said, you will have to renounce your mother and your brothers and take up your cross and, and follow me. Uh, he went into a kind of exile uh, when he lost the chairmanship of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in, in, in the 60s. And chiefly, he was willing to die. He liked St. Stephen. Uh, he was willing to go to jail. He went to jail 45 times. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Parchman, uh, for God's sake, uh, which uh, the Mississippi prison that Faulkner described as destination doom. And they were quite conscious, Lewis and the others, mm -hmm quite conscious that they were living out a biblical life. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, and, and just to, to add to that, you know, a little more about him, um, John, is that he was this catalyst, this sort of common denominator in the movement. And I'm not sure people really knew about him until maybe recently. I mean, everybody knew about King, some knew about Jim Lawson, C.T. Vivian, unfortunately, who just who just left us. Um, you know, there's the I have a dream speech, and everybody remembers that. But in your book, you 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 clearly point out that that Harry Belafonte says, but what yeah. happened to John has this great speech, and to him it was like the Gettysburg Address. And then you say, John, that the you describe the difference between the two as such. 
In his closing remarks, King spoke from a mountaintop, a prophet bringing word from on high. Lewis spoke more simply from the valley, among the people whose burden he knew because they were his burdens too. And my question to you is, there is a kind of humility throughout John's life. You know, he didn't ever really seek higher office. Was there, look, we all have egos, but was there an ego there? You didn't see it. He was happy kind of behind the scenes. Can you talk a little bit more about that? It's it's a great question. And it's one of the reasons I wrote the book, honestly. Um, he never sold out, right? He never went on the board of American Express. Uh, never a whiff of scandal of any kind around him. And that's pretty remarkable, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for someone in, who was in the public eye from the time he was 19 until he was 80, right. uh, just because we're all fallen, frail, and fallible, right? right. Um, there was an ego, there was pride, there was anger, but more than anyone else I've ever known, and I include President Bush in this, um, he mastered it. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it was a discipline that came from seeing his work as divinely inspired. My, the John Lewis I write about is a religious figure. Mm -hmm. He is a figure more conversant with the kingdom of God than the kingdom of men. And people can dismiss that and yeah. scholarly friends who think that calling him a saint was uh, overkill. But Jim Lawson agreed with me, so to hell with them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Lawson, I'm fine. Uh, you know, okay. it's like talk the, about the, a saint. He was amazing. Most, he is amazing. The most important review I got of the book about 41 was Bush 43 saying, "That's an authentic portrait of Dad." And I said, "I'm done." Right? I mean, that's it. That that if it's authentic, I'm I'm there. I I believe every every word I wrote in there. Uh, I, I believe it firmly because saints don't have to be saviors. Right. Saints just have to be a little bit better than the rest of us with a little more consistency. And so I, I think there was, surely there was pride. Sure. I mean, he could have, I once asked President Bush, um, <laughs> this is sort of similar. So when you ask President Bush in sort of passing conversation, you know, why did you do all this? Why did you go into politics? You know, he'd say service. And I finally said one day, we were down in Houston, and I said, that's great, sir, but, you know, you could have just opened a soup kitchen. You know, you saw ultimate control. You wanted the nuclear codes at the height of the Cold War. You know, it was more than that. And it led to a very important moment uh, that I wrote about in the book, which is where he picked that big left fist and said, yeah, there's drive. It's be number one. It's be the captain of the team. You know, there's, there's stuff that's wrong with that, but there's stuff that's good about that. Mm -hmm. That's the human condition, right? right? And so if you have that drive, the key thing is not to be embarrassed about it, but what do you do with it? Right. And George, both Bushes used that drive to try to make kinder and gentler the life of the world. John Lewis used that drive to summon a nation to moral account and did it in a way that was almost unimaginably physically courageous. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know the pictures. We all know the bridge. We all know that. That's what we all saw. I think he was far in far more danger on those 40 occasions. He was arrested five mm -hmm. times as a member of Congress, 40 times during the movement. Think of how much danger he was in when we couldn't see him, right? When he went into those Southern jails, when okay. he went into parchment, how easy it would have been for there to have been an incident mm -hmm. and, and he didn't come back out. Right. Um, let me tell you quickly, because there, there's another commonality here. Um, the two most, the two men who have moved me most in public life are George H.W. Bush and John Lewis. And it's why this conversation is fascinating to me and I appreciate your putting them in the same frame. And in both cases, it was because they didn't pretend to be perfect. They didn't try to hoodwink you something. They didn't try to sell you on something. They were human beings in the arena 
they both wanted to shape reality beyond themselves, but they weren't driven by a, an indiscriminate will to power. Mm -hmm. They were driven to use power to a larger end. We all have the will to power. That's the lesson of Eden, right? right. The test comes with what you do with it. And those two men mm -hmm. both left their fingerprints on the world in a way that I think should be both illuminating and inspiring for the rest of us. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's beautifully said. And, you know, there, he was a quiet figure in some ways, but also there were others around him, John, that I want to touch on a little bit because I think are just as important and, and frankly ties me um, back to, to Barbara Bush. And, and that in the movement is the way I frame her is Diane Nash. A lot of people don't even know who Diane Nash is. John was very close to her. She was fierce. She was determined. She was unstoppable. I mean, one could compare her to, to Barbara Bush. You know, I know her children have said she's an enforcer. I suspect Diane Nash was an enforcer. And, and there are stories in your book which, which talk about that. We all know about Rosa Parks. Um, yep. But Diane Nash is not known that way, but she was this force behind the planning and the strategy behind the Freedom Rides. In fact, at one point, you have this, you talk about this incredible story, right? So John Siegenthaler, the president calls him up and who's this young woman by the name of Diane Nash? And he, he puts her down. Is. Who the Who hell is Diane Nash, right? Yeah. And guys, by the way, I'm willing to bet that hell is probably not the word that was used, but go ahead. <laughs> and he says, right? And he says, get her on the phone to Siegenthaler, right, John? And he calls her up and he says, what are you doing? Stop this. This is crazy. Young lady, you're going to get yourself hurt and all of your, your friends in college. And she basically says, I don't care. I'm not backing down. And in fact, do you understand, Mr. Siegenthaler? We've written our wills. We are prepared to die. She was 22. John, tell us a little bit more about this incredible woman and the relationship between between she and, and John. Yeah, Diane was from Chicago. Uh, is She lives in Chicago now, uh, still active in various movements. Yeah. Um, and um, she was a beauty, uh, I don't know if you're supposed to say this anymore, but she was a beauty queen. Uh, and came down to Fisk University, historically black school here in Nashville, and had never encountered the official Jim Crow. Uh, and like John and Troy, was revulsed by it, right? Mm -hmm. Repelled. Right. And this is this, this unfolds. Um, Jim Lawson, uh, whom we talked about, uh, has come to Nashville. He's teaching uh, nonviolent workshops in the basement of a little red brick Methodist church, Clark Memorial. Uh, and Diane is, Ms. Nash is one of them. John Lewis is one, Bernard Lafayette, James Bevel. Uh, Diane ends up marrying James Bevel. Um, the criti one of the critical moments of the 20th century is, a, is Diane and the, the scene you're talking about with, with the great John Siegenthaler, whom we lost about six years ago. Um, and basically the Freedom Ride has just come to a crashing halt. Uh, in Alabama. And John has actually left it because he was had an interview for a foreign mission trip that he ended up not taking. So he was in Nashville. Uh, he was trying to get back. He and Diane are talking about it. And there was a huge amount of pressure at that point to stop the Freedom Ride. It had gone to Alabama. There was publicity about it. Howard K. Smith was there reporting on it. But it was time to stop. That was kind of the, the that was General uh, Attorney General Kennedy's view. Mm -hmm. Let's let's have a cooling off period was the phrase right. Kennedy used. And actually, John in the March on Washington speech says we are not we're too tired to have any more cooling off periods. And it was Nash who said we're going to go on. Mm -hmm. And so the Freedom Ride ends up in Jackson, Mississippi, and without her decision to press forward, no matter what, history could be different. Um, right. There was another scene that's, it's, it's almost a movie, just this one night. Bull Connor personally drives John Lewis and three other Freedom Riders from Birmingham 
to the middle of nowhere, the state line between Alabama and Tennessee, and drops them off in the middle of Klan country, basically telling them, go back to Nashville. I don't care how you get there. And they walk down. The, I mean, Bull, I'm not saying that Bull Connor sent someone. Bull Connor <laughs> drove the car. Right. It's just you can't. It, it, sometimes you, if it were a script, you bounce it because yeah, it, right. it was too perfect. They walk along the train tracks, John and the other three Freedom Riders. They come because the train tracks, that's where the black people live, right? right. Uh, they come to a house. The man doesn't want to let them in, but the woman says, okay. He calls Diane. Diane says, we got to go back. You got to keep going. Critical moment in the 20th century. And then the man, in the, they wake up, and the man goes to three different stores to buy breakfast so that he won't tip anyone off by buying all the groceries at one store. Right. He didn't want anyone, he didn't want to attract attention. Sure. sure. And so, and all this happened the day before yesterday. You know, it, it's, it, you know, it's not quite in my lifetime, but pretty close. Um, I was born a little bit after this. You know, Mrs. Bush told the stories about driving from, uh, I guess, Midland and Odessa and then possibly Houston, but certainly Midland, uh, to Maine in the summer, to Washington or to Maine in the summers. And they would have their beloved housekeeper with them and they mm-hmm. couldn't go in. They couldn't all go into the same places. Right. Uh, Lyndon Johnson told that story, same same kind of experience. And I, I'm not making them equivalent. But it's important to remember, if you're on the precipice of giving up hope about the country, 60 years ago, we lived in an unimaginably systemically discriminatory society. So don't give up hope because it can get better. At the same time, if you think what I just said is a little too liberal, 60 years ago, this is what the way things were. And so, you know, history is not a fairy tale. There was never a once upon a time. There'll never be a happily ever after. It's an arena in which our hearts and minds do constant battle between our worst impulses and our better angels. Mm -hmm. And I think the lesson of John Lewis, the lesson of the Bushes is... If the better angels can win 51% of the time, that's a heck of a good day. Right. Speaking of the better angels and back to Jim Lawson, you know, he was really John's teacher. He was, he was his, his guide, um, you know, this whole and Gandhi and all of those teachings that this whole nonviolent piece, John, I think is this approach. It was complicated. It was hard. I mean, it looks easy some 50 years later, but it was really hard. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, about that and even its application today? That, that wasn't easy. Uh, it, it's the hardest, it's, it's the most radical thing you can do. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go downtown and let people put cigarettes out on us and we're not gonna do anything about it. Right. We're gonna accept it and we're gonna love them as ourselves. No, thank you. I'm not interested in that. But John Lewis was, Diane Nash was, innumerable people whose names we don't know, but should, were able to say, you said, white America, you said that all men were created equal and were endowed by their creator over certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, you said it. Exactly. That's right. So get thee behind me, Satan. Um, And... Look, I talked to Diane Nash about this this summer when I was doing the book. Um, She said nonviolence was an an essential philosophical view, but it was also eminently practical. Mm -hmm. There was no other way to do it. They would have if they tried to take up arms, they would have been destroyed. Uh, It was a morally accessible, a morally efficacious Mm -hmm. way of engaging. But my God. I was just looking at these numbers the other day. Um, something like 65% of white Americans disapproved of the March on Washington. Think about that for a second. Wow. 
two thirds, yeah, of the country dis you disapproved of going to Lincoln Memorial and talking about emancipation. You, you you took the trouble to disapprove of that, and you know one of the things that I'm very wary of because of what I do for a living and thinking about the past and writing about the past is not subjecting the past to retrospective moralizing, right. self-righteousness, holding myself up. What you have to do is you have to put yourself in that moment and listen as best you can for what the voices of the time were saying as well. And if you go to the civil rights movement, you hear those voices. They were insistent. They were ultimately dispositive. But it was never unanimous. And I like to think, look, I'm, I'm a boringly heterosexual white Southern male Episcopal, right? I, mean, I got, uh, things work out for me in this, right? They just do. Um, I don't know where I would have been on that. Hmm. I was in 1969, so I, I sort of escaped. Right. If I'd been born in 49, I like to think I would have been in that 35% that approved of the March on Washington, but I don't know. I don't know. So the reason I wrote this book, honestly, was you have to tell the story. And the story is, it's not that it's simple, but it is pretty straightforward, which is there was an injustice and there were people driven by religious faith who wanted to right that injustice. Mm -hmm. And a larger point here, just parenthetically, is there are millions upon millions of Americans who profess an allegiance to a biblical tradition of morality and grace and love. There is a large gap, beginning with me, between the profession of those ideals and the practice of them. And I'd submit that our public life would be proportionately better if we could close that gap between profession and practice even a little bit. Mm -hmm. Good point. Well, that's a great segue, John, to, to the beloved community. And when I think about, um, I'm going to let you talk a little bit more about that, but King described it as a, a dream of equality and opportunity. And when I think about Barbara Bush and, and George Herbert Walker Bush, just some things that they did that I think are part and parcel of creating that beloved community. So you have Barbara Bush who creates the foundation for literacy and knows that literacy is is so important in, in the daily life of the average American um, to holding a baby with AIDS. John, do you, you remember this? People in this country, you wouldn't touch somebody with, with HIV and AIDS. I was blessed and humbled to, to work um, at PEPFAR with 43 and to understand that global program, but this was way before that. She held a baby with AIDS and she told everybody else that that love is love, right? And that it's going to be okay to hold a, a child or another human being with AIDS. To to his incredible work with around the reunification of Germany and the, you know, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall to he signed the National Literacy Act in 1991, which I don't think a lot of people know. And then earlier we talked about Americans with disability, but those are, for me, are pieces or bricks if you were building a house around a beloved community that that ties, again, back to the connection with, with John. And tell us a little bit more about this beloved community that he and Nash and everybody in the movement were working towards. And frankly, we're still working towards that. I mean, I, I think and I hope that that's part of this new bubbling up that's, that's going on. Can you talk a little bit more about the beloved community and what that means? Sure. But the beloved community is a phrase that began with Josiah Royce, a theologian, in late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, he wrote a short book called The Problem of Christianity, which should have been longer. <laughs> um, but uh, he's easy to, but that's all right. Um, the beloved community was another way of talking about the kingdom of God. And John Lewis and I spent 28 years arguing about this. He believed, Dr. King believed, that if our dispositions of heart and mind were in the right place, that we could, in fact, bring about a the kingdom of God on earth. That, as Amos said, righteousness could run down like waters and justice like a mighty stream. Um, I don't believe that. 
Uh, I think that the fallen nature of the world is such that it's not going to be possible. But John did and was willing to die for it. So listen to him, not to me. Um, I think that's a great analogy, a metaphor about building uh, a house uh, in which we can find shelter uh, and security and equality. Um, the the achievements you you list of, of the Bushes are interesting to me in part because of a point I, I try to make a lot and not very successfully, but I'll keep trying. As Robert Louis Stevenson said, the duty of a Christian is not to succeed but to fail cheerfully. Uh, mm. so I fail cheerfully all the time, but we remember presidents. We remember people, not when they build walls. But again, when they build bridges, right? We remember, we remember Nixon favorably because he went to China. Right. Uh, President Bush and the ADA and what you, you listed. President Reagan and the end of the Cold War. President right. Johnson and civil rights. Uh, President Eisenhower and interstates. I mean, mm -hmm. it's people have President Bush and PEPFAR. Mm -hmm. It's about opening the possibilities, widening the possibilities of American life, not constricting them. And the beloved community will be realized, again, in direct proportion to our capacity to open our arms as opposed to clenching our fists. And that's not a partisan point. And I don't think either party has a monopoly on virtue or the platform that's going to make this happen. But next time you're thinking about this, think about what you remember presidents and eras for. Mm. And it's almost never going to be somebody who limited immigration, right? Or who right. the funding for this or that. Not that money's the answer, but it's about possibility. Mm -hmm. and, and, and President Bush, pre look, President Bush Sr. paid a political price for this. Because there's nothing I would have said in the last time, in the time we've been together, that he would have disagreed with. Um, you know, he 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 would have been on he would have been on alert for you know stray liberal pieces of orthodoxy. I'm not a liberal, but he that's what he would be thinking about. Um, but he was a little out of phase even then, right? I mean, he he, he was an Eisenhower Republican in a more conservative era and paid a price for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I promise you this, the things we remember him for, and the things we remember his son for favorably, are when they lifted their vision and took us along with them, not when they looked back. Right, right. You know, as I think about sort of the movement and moving forward, you know, there was a lot of progress, John, and you know, we had the rights act 64, 65, 67, right? So we move forward, but you get to the end of the 60s. A lot of change is happening in the movement. There's a split, if you will, right? You talked a little bit about this earlier. John is sort of kicked out of SNCC. He's no longer the chair. There's a big vote. He's he's gone. He's sort of depressed or almost in exile, right? He moves to New York. He works at this small foundation. Not really sure what's going on with, with his life at that point. Because there's a split around violence versus nonviolence, right? And to your earlier point, John stuck to his guns, and it was about continuing to stay on the nonviolent path, no question. So in '68, he gets he's devastated. You say he's like on his knees, crying. You know, King is gone. Robert is assassinated. Um, you know, do you think that something happened in those later years, John, that kind of stalled the progress or stalled? John's vision of the beloved community and why perhaps maybe today we are still grappling with kind of the unfinished business, whether you call it systemic poverty or discrimination, poor health outcomes. In our yeah. case, according to our mission, lower literacy. Did something happen in that period that that kind of stopped things? And now we're trying to pick that up again. I know it's a tough time for John. It's very tough time for him uh, and for the country, right? I mean, 1968, uh, 
46 Americans were dying every day in Vietnam. Uh, we lose King, we lose Kennedy, the Chicago Democratic National Convention. 55, if you add George Wallace's and Richard Nixon's popular vote totals, you get 55% at the end of that year. So 55% of the country was voting for either Richard Nixon or George Wallace in 68. So, you know, I have a slightly, um, I don't want to say inverted view of that, but a slightly different angle of vision. And it's that it's not that the movement stopped. That's not surprising. What's surprising is that it took root and did as much as it did as quickly as it did. Hmm. And that sense of urgency and that the steadiness of purpose is really hard to sustain mm -hmm. decade to decade to decade. Right. So it's why I think and hope that the 2020, uh, the terrible events that have led to our, our rising consciousness about these things might have the same kind of galvanizing effect, mm. sequential movement that, say, Emmett Till and the Brown mm -hmm. decision uh and the freedom rise dissidents did then um it's really hard to change this country and <laughs> the constitution acknowledges that we are sinful and driven by appetite and ambition it's fundamentally a calvinist document uh it assumes we'll do the wrong thing so it makes it hard to do anything right. uh, that was the insight not a bad one served us pretty well uh, but again, the moments we're proudest of are the moments where we've included more people as full and equal creatures of God in this compact. And so um, I think the lesson of the movement, and again, the reason I did this project was to say, until July 17th of this year, walking among us was a man who could have been one of the saints of old. And if he could do it, then the rest of us can too. And, you know, I absolutely agree with that. And John, you know, just to take, bring it a little bit back to, to literacy and, and actually in the book, you have a wonderful story about a young woman by the name of Santima Clark. She meets John in, I think in the, in the fifties or so, she's from South Carolina and she's this dogged civil rights activist. She's part of the movement, but she does her work through the lens of, of literacy. You want to tell us a little bit more about her? Cause she's powerful. Yes. We were thrilled to, to learn about her. She's a real yeah. hero in the movement. Yeah, she was. Uh, I think they met at Highlander, uh, Highlander Folk School uh, in the mm -hmm. middle of Tennessee. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite uh, details is Andy Young uh, remembered that he used to have a Highlander martini, which was a martini in a Vienna sausage can. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I love that touch. Um, remember, it, it, as you know, uh, the central obstacle to voting rights were literacy tests. Right. But literacy was very broadly defined. It was, you know, recite the preamble to the Constitution. It was right. recite the preamble to the Alabama Constitution. It was just crazy right. stuff. Right. Um, and what uh, Ms. Clark did, Septima Clark did, is she had a voter literacy project. Mm -hmm. And it was to educate anybody to pass those tests. And what she saw was, as your foundation does, is that you can talk as much as you want about saving systems, but you need to save every individual soul. Okay. So her focus was on soul by soul by soul. Mm -hmm. And um, it was enormously effective. Uh, she was a vital figure in, in all of this. And I'd urge people, I mean, it's um, the one thing that, that John was always uncomfortable with was, you know, I was one of many. And that's true. Uh, and the civil rights movement is an endless collection 
of amazing stories about seemingly ordinary people who did extraordinary things. And there's a rich literature and, you know, at a minimum, go rewatch Eyes on the Prize, right? I mean, just, just go do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And you, you, you begin, it puts you in conversation with the best of the American reform movement. No, oh, that's great. Great. So, so John, we're in a very interesting, uh, we think about history and obviously you're a student of history. Um, there's a lot going on right now, just like there was when, <laughs> imagine that, um, you know, just like there was in the, in the 60s. And, you know, just, just to take a moment and put on your historian hat, um, we're in a unique time in American history. Um, but can you comment on this moment, but also the perspective we need to, how do we hold this moment sort of in perspective, if, if that's a, if that's a, a way to look at it and any ideas or thoughts you have about helping us work through the uncertainty and the anxiety, I think, um, but understanding it from a historical perspective, I'd love for you to take a few minutes around that. Yeah, briefly, the forces that seem to be flowing in American life, isolationism, nativism, extremism, extreme partisanship, racism, these are perennial forces. No single election, no single piece of legislation is ever going to eradicate these forces. The historical task before us is the same historical task that's been with us from the very beginning, which is how do we manage and marshal those forces so that they ebb instead of flow? And right now they're flowing. Mm -hmm. I would argue that the great insight of the American project was that we were a product of the Enlightenment for all of its imperfections. It was de the Enlightenment was devoted to the idea, the scientific revolution, the European Enlightenment, the Scottish moral Enlightenment, the reformations, the translation of sacred scripture into the vernacular, an entire reorientation of the world from being seen as vertical, right? Where popes and princes and prelates and kings were given mm -hmm. authority over all of us. It was turning into a more horizontal world where we were born with the capacity to determine our own destinies. I'm fully aware of the exclusions in that. But the American story at its best has been the, the inclusion of the previously excluded. And what I would urge everybody to do is think about what you want posterity to say about you and your generation. Do you want to be the generation that embraced and managed an incredible level of diversity in a globalized world in an attempt to run the most complicated multi-ethnic democratic capitalist experiment in the history of the world and we did it successfully? Or do you want to be a generation like, say, the 19, late teens and 20s, the last pandemic, the last pandemic helped produce the second rise of the Ku Klux Klan, restrictions on immigration, and ultimately uh, uh, isolationism, and ultimately a Great Depression. I know which side I want to be on, right? I mean, I, I want to be John Lewis. I don't want to be Bull Connor. I want to be Margaret Chase Smith or Prescott Bush, who stood up against Joe McCarthy. I don't want to be McCarthy. I want to be Senator Bush, right? And so what I would urge everybody to do is use their brains as well as their guts. Examine the candidates. And I think it's a pretty straightforward question. Which of these candidates stands the best chance of creating an American moment of which we can be unambiguously proud. Mm -hmm. And John, one last question. Anything, we talked a lot about John Lewis. By the way, the book is fantastic. So we encourage everybody to, to, to get it. Any last points or thoughts, anything that big through lines that you wanted to share about John Lewis and his life and, and legacy before we close out. Just this. Uh, again, I, I wrote this in part because there are a lot of us who are religiously inclined. And 
it's easy to do that on Sunday mornings or on occasion and not to see the implications of that gospel in all aspects of our life. Uh, one of the best moments in Tom Sawyer is where Sawyer says a evangelist, a preacher came through town and he was so good that even Huck Finn was saved until Tuesday. One of the things <laughs> we kind of try to do is get saved until Wednesday or Thursday. So I think John and John's life, like President Bush's life, is a testament to the durability and the efficacy of integrity and of love. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a beautiful way to end. And John, thank you again. We're so grateful for taking the time for your insights and your wonderful book and to learn I'm more sorry. about John's work. I'm sorry McGraw isn't here. He's about <laughs> half a block away, probably, you know, playing with his Xbox. So uh, I'll okay. tell him just to. Tell, tell him we said hello, and next time we want faith. That's the deal, right? That's the deal. Your lips to God's ears. I love it. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye-bye.